Pikmin is quite the franchise, sort of spawning from that original demonstration software slash battle royale game, I guess, Super Mario 128, it eventually was given an entirely unique image, not before being conceptualized as Adam and Eve. That would have been weird. Nintendo was set to have this be one of its premier games for their newest console, the GameCube. There was a trailer included within the menus of Luigi's Mansion, a console launch title, and there was a few trophies for it in the massive holiday title, Super Smash Bros. Melee. Oh yeah, the game also released the same day as Melee. I wonder which one sold more. Pikmin would go on to be one of Nintendo's bigger franchises out there. It's obviously not at the level of like Mario, Zelda, Pokemon, not even Metroid, but it's definitely a notable name in Nintendo's giant pantheon. We got three main games, we got a spin-off, Captain Olimar is playable in Super Smash Bros., and we got plenty of extras. There's a whole lot that this plant simulator slash real-time strategy game brought to the table. Like a Bulborb plush that can conveniently fit a Pikmin plush inside of. It's perfect. And right about now, fans of this franchise are really salivating over Pikmin 4, the game that does in fact exist, but also doesn't exist at the same time. It's Schrodinger's Pikmin game. And I'll be honest, I just got sick of waiting, so instead of waiting for anything Pikmin related to drop on the Switch, I'm going to take this time to play through all four of the existing Pikmin games and talk about them throughout the entirety of this month. You can call it Pikmin Month, that's very very simple, you can call it Pick Month if you want to be a little creative, but I got something a little better. Welcome to Olive March. Eh? Eh? For those of you who are still sticking around, let's talk about Pikmin 1. Pikmin tells the story of Captain Olimar, who has crash-landed on a mysterious planet after flying directly into a meteor. I guess space shuttles also have their own blind spots. Didn't know that, good to know. And already a neat little tidbit here, Olimar's name is more or less an anagram of Mario. Pretty clever. He awakens to find his ship, the Dolphin, named after the GameCube's codename, totally destroyed with pieces scattering everywhere. The oxygen of the planet is also considered poisonous, and he only has 30 days to live unless he can repair his ship. That is a whole lot just stacked up against one guy. It really goes to show, man, this is a good life lesson. You gotta pay attention when you're driving. But being stranded and useless on said random planet, what do you do? Well, you start plucking an army of plant-like creatures, the Pikmin, named after a brand of Pick Pick carrots that Olimar really likes. And you do this by utilizing their nests, the onions, named after, uh, well, I, I guess the shape of an onion. I, uh, I think the cleverness of the names only goes so far. And from there you go on an adventure. That's all the plot that we have, but that's really all the plot that we need. This is a story all about exploring a brand new world and just trying to overcome all of the odds that are stacked up against you. And honestly, more enjoyable than any potential story here is seeing Olimar chronicle his journey every single night, reacting to what he just experienced, and sometimes even talking about memories of his son. Wow, that is a great way to throw out some character development in a game like this. Olimar is a family man. Cool. The beginning area, the impact site, is pretty small and lacks any sort of threat, giving you a good chance to understand just how this brand new franchise expects you to play it. By commanding your Pikmin towards objects, they will begin to carry them back to either their onion or to your ship. Items, such as these colored pellets and fallen enemies, can be used to grow your army, while the ship parts naturally get sucked right back into your ship and they somehow reinstall themselves. That's, pr that's pretty good technology, if you ask me. And a lot of this game consists of taking your army and just chucking them at anything that stands in your way. And man, I gotta tell you, the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, these are some of my favorite controllers for a reason. The process of doing this is damn near perfection. It is so satisfying just pointing at something and then seeing your Pikmin land on it and begin attacking and they make the little noises. Oh, it's damn near therapeutic. This is easily the way to play Pikmin. And this is of course talking about the Wii version, which naturally released many years later after the original. But for the sake of this video, I did have the opportunity to play the original GameCube version, and I gotta be honest with you, This kinda blows, dude. 
I guess we can chalk this one up to the lack of nostalgia or something, but man, I, I just cannot play Pikmin with the analog sticks. It's like this weird system where the left stick controls not only Olimar, but the cursor at the same time. I guess really there was no other way to do it since you still need a second stick for other maneuvers, but the lack of total precision here is an absolute nightmare for me. Maybe for some of you out there, analog sticks is the only way you can experience this game, but for me, once you play the Wii version, there is absolutely no going back. I'm actually able to sort of sequence break with this one. Hell yeah, dude. Not saying that disaster still won't strike from time to time, but but it happens less. Yeah, I'm just gonna, just gonna restart that one. I'm not gonna have that much Pikmin blood on my hands, not today. Also, you can do this. I don't know what he's doing, but he seems to be enjoying himself. Alrighty, and with that, we have everything going back to base. That is perfect. Just gotta round up this mushroom real quick. Uh... What happened? The controls here are super simplistic. For a game like this, it's not about over-inundating you with a ton of options, it's about mastering the few options that you're given. There is a 30 day limit to complete this game, each day taking about 13 minutes or so, because when night falls, the enemies come out looking for dinner. And easily, some of the fun here is learning how to maximize your time. Where all the enemies are, when to take them out, do you want to go for all the ship parts as soon as you find them, or do you want to clear out the pathway first? Maybe you just want to take a day to grind Pikmin out and then find Nectar to give them flowers, making them faster and stronger. Your adventure is entirely your own. Quite a few times in this game you could find yourself just sitting and waiting for things to get done, and on the surface, that is a problem, you gotta just sit there and be super super patient, but most times, it's probably beneficial to let those Pikmin do something while you go do something else. It's all about multitasking here. Although you do have to waste time individually plucking each and every Pikmin, that's pretty annoying considering there's beta footage out there that shows off that the whistle that you have used to be able to pull out every single grounded Pikmin at once, why did you take that out? Understanding each Pikmin's strength so you know how to fill out your 100 plant army is also important. The reds are the most powerful and can walk through fire, yellows can be thrown higher as well as carry bombs, and the blues can go through water. The bomb thing, I'll admit, that's a, that's a really, that's a really weird one. Each Pikmin type has hands, but somehow only the yellow ones can use them? The other Pikmin, I guess, see bombs and they're like, yeah, yeah, no, I know what happens here. This ain't it for me, chief. Meanwhile, the yellows, they just, they, they just don't care. What a soldier, rest in peace. And I gotta say, man, I adore the design of the Pikmins too. They are the perfect amount of cute and just weird looking. I'm sure the design behind this game was to also be a technological showcase for the GameCube, since you can have up to 100 of these little worker ant creatures on screen doing stuff at once and the frame rate rarely ever dips. That's pretty impressive. And then learning how different each location is, is also satisfying. The forest navel is dark and murky and very tightly packed, while the distant spring is bright, kind of foggy and pretty open. The game manages to keep the nature aesthetic throughout and does just enough to keep things diverse from start to finish. All of these things factored in make for an adventure that is really fun to experience your first time through, and then also fun in a different way, repeat playthroughs if you want to perfect your strategies. What initially took me roughly 25 days or so to complete on my first playthrough, I've knocked it down to about half of that. And I hear this complaint a lot, but people really don't like the idea of being timed when they play a video game. With each in-game day taking less than 15 minutes, you gotta dedicate time to taking Pikmin out at the start of every day, by the end you have to make sure everyone's all rounded up. I get it, it could be kind of annoying if you just want to play as freely as you want, but to me, there's just a joy in taking advantage of the world that Pikmin has created. Those monsters are devastating, they're more powerful at night, gotta make sure every one of them is safe. I have an army here that I'm bringing into battle, but I also have to make sure I have that army for the next day. I really like it, I know a lot of people don't. When you have something like the Wallywog that's ready to jump and you got Pikmin under it, you can tell that's very stressful, I don't like it. And while this adventure is all about repairing your ship, everything that you do is actually preparing you for the boss battles. And it's like, they're not even like these massive encounters or anything. The unique boss monsters just sort of happen to be there. They're treated as just another obstacle, much like any other enemy. I know that goes against almost every video game tradition out there, but I really enjoyed how the bosses were handled here. 
there's something about them just being integrated with the world that you're exploring freely, as opposed to just having a boss level, if that makes sense. No matter what, it still requires appropriate planning to take them down. There aren't many of them, but they still offer a unique threat. There are even two bosses that can appear on alternate days back at the impact site neither of which are actually threatening in the slightest, it's just more so neat than anything. But then there's the matter of the Smoky Prog, a secret optional boss at the Distant Spring that only shows up before day 15. I like, I don't even really know how to properly explain this demonic looking thing. He, he doesn't even look finished, like half of him is just gone and it's, it's all smoky, it's weird, it's creepy, I don't like it. All I really know about it is it absolutely demolishes Pikmin. Ooh yeah, that's what we in the industry like to call a big oof. And you see, when I lose a bunch of Pikmin like that, I will gladly restart the day and undo all of my damages. But if I lose, like, just one or two, eh. If only a couple Pikmin die in one day, I really don't worry about it too much. Yeah, no matter how many times you say it, it still sounds demented when you say it out loud. But after enough time spent on the planet, eventually you score all of the ship pieces that you need. Actually, some of them are optional, too. It's really weird, because why not go for all of them, but okay. It's a relatively simple process getting all of these. The only one that really stands out is this one, where you have to change a Pikmin's type from blue to yellow and then back to blue. That's a pretty cool idea, and it's a really good test for proper multitasking. Everything you've worked for culminates at the final trial, a really short level that ends off with the Emperor Bulblax, a freaky looking abomination that lives underground until you decide to mess with it. And I gotta say, even though most of the bosses in this game are just sort of there, like I said, this is a really neat final boss in terms of tension. The only way you can successfully take this one out is with the bombs, which one screw up can lead to a few lost lives. And then sometimes he crouches down, his eyes get all big and he jumps. It's kind of terrifying, I'm not gonna lie. But you just sort of do that on loop for a little bit and then soon enough, he goes down and we get the last part of the ship, a piggy bank. That is not at all what I expected. I guess the last thing he needed before he went home is all of the money that he saved up until then. I mean, I mean, to be fair, that piggy bank is also an optional treasure, so you don't even need to do the final boss. That's kind of cool, I guess. I don't care, that Bull Blacks is ugly, he's going down. Olimar says goodbye to his new friends, the Pikmin that were with you learned how to fend for themselves, and we see the captain fly off back home. It's a pretty great ending music, I gotta say. And then you get to marvel at how good you did. I think I did pretty well with this playthrough here. Not really all that proud of the whole uh, 75 lives thing, but I mean, hey, it's in the past. And then we see the credits, and I love how they roll across the planet. That's, that's a really cool look. And that is that for the best ending, but actually, one of the best parts about Pikmin 1 that goes completely unrecognized is that it actually has two more endings. If you manage to get all 25 mandatory ship parts, but not the complete 30, Olimar, like, he, he just bails on all of the Pikmin without letting them know. So they just end up like sitting there and wonder if they're ever gonna see him again. Oh my God, Olimar's a jerk in this one. I can see why it's not canon. But then the actual best ending of the game, if you don't even manage to get those 25 pieces, Olimar tries to leave the same exact way, except yeah, no, it's not a smart move when the ship doesn't have all the right parts. And then, as the captain is legitimately nearing death, let's not forget that, the Pikmin carry him to an onion and then plant him. This is better than the actual best ending. But to be fair, you don't get this awesome recap of all the monsters that we encountered in those last two endings. This is a great reward on top of getting all the ship parts. And this too has fantastic music. This is one of my favorite tracks in the game by far. This rare subspecies of Bulborb has a certain Oh boy, um, it, indefatigability. Okay, we get it, somebody went to college. The game occasionally has its rough moments, but overall, Pikmin is a fantastic game. The act of growing an army and taking them out to battle on a journey that you forge on your own 
is just simple fun and satisfaction. But diving deep into the mechanics and multitasking unlocks a whole new level of challenge for a great reason to replay this game multiple times. I've played it through like 15 times at this point and I'm still not sick of it. And actually, there is a challenge mode too, changing up aspects of each of the levels, tasking you with figuring out the best way to get as many Pikmin as possible in a single day. It's great stuff. The Wii version is definitely the way to go in my opinion, but no matter what console you play it on, Pikmin is a fantastic game that is worth experiencing. Even if you've never played a real-time strategy game before, I had never played an RTS before Pikmin, and I gotta tell you, after playing it, I get it now man, my mind is just going a million miles a minute, the micromanaging I'm a huge fan of nowadays, this is a perfect gateway into that genre. But, maybe you just know that that's not your thing then maybe Pikmin 2 is what you're looking for. Gonna have to tune in next time to find out. Are you gonna chew? That's very rude. The original Pikmin helped kick off the GameCube in a major way. Wanting to spice things up, not only did Nintendo launch their N64 successor with a Luigi game instead of a Mario game, but soon after, an entirely new IP, featuring a little tiny captain commanding hundreds of plant-like creatures to explore every nook and cranny of an unknown planet in order to repair your ship and get home. And it was great. And despite Pikmin 1 releasing the same day as Super Smash Bros. Melee, the game still managed to sell well over a million units. So yeah, it was successful. Naturally, a sequel was on the horizon, releasing just a few years later. The original game didn't have much of a marketing push back then either, it sort of just released and that was about it. Things were about to change with Pikmin 2 because Nintendo decided to go in a, uh, different direction for the sequel? I said with mustard. Make it two. Mustard. Mustard. mustard! Uh, okay, I'll- I'll buy the game. I guess. Nothing really all that interesting regarding this game's development. The only thing that was kinda neat is uh, knowing that the Wii version took forever to come out in America, Japan, and Europe had it for years. Well, we had to sit and wait that was fun. It really couldn't be simpler here. The first game did well, so they made a second one. It's not really any more complicated than that, but when it comes to Pikmin 2, do they do something totally different, or do they do more of the same? Yes. Both. Welcome back to Ala March, everybody. I'm totally sticking with that name while I can. And now... Pikmin 2. Ah, uh, dude, the title screen is really cool here. It was pretty in the first one for sure, but now stuff actually happens with this one. That's pretty awesome. After the events of Pikmin 1, it turns out we were on Earth that whole time, by the way, Captain Olimar returns to his home planet of Hokotate, and his place of work, Hokotate Fright, has fallen on some hard times financially. Something about Olimar's co-worker, Louie, running into an issue with a monster on his mission or something like that, but regardless, the president of the company had to take out a massive loan as well as sell off a bunch of their assets. Yeah, basically everything. Luckily though, a bottle cap that Olimar brought home with him is actually worth quite a lot on his home planet. So of course, Olimar with young boy Louis in tow head right back to Earth to collect some treasure and pay off the company debt. He literally just came back from a life-threatening journey, not given a second of time to relax, see his wife and kids. Nah, that's that's the true tragedy right here. As Alamar returns to orbit for Earth, he then hits a tree on his descent. I'm starting to believe that he's just a bad driver. This separates the two captains, and from there, the adventure begins. So yeah, the goal this time is to gather a bunch of treasure, and the process of doing that is kinda... more or less the same as before. Technically? What's really cool is a lot of the treasures are just like straight up real world brands. That's very weird. No matter how much time has passed, it'll never get old seeing the Pikmin dig up like a 7-up bottle cap, the lid for a jar of Vlasic pickles, and like a straight up tube of chapstick.
Now listen here, Nintendo. You're talking to a YouTuber here. I know a thing or two about shameless sponsorship spots. You're not gonna pull the wool over my eyes. You definitely got paid for this. Now if you excuse me. I bought a jar of pickles for this video. <laughs> I always thought this was pretty cool, not just because, haha, it's funny, you get to see real objects in a Nintendo game, but it also really helps emphasize just how small Olimar is. The idea here is that Olimar is not even an inch tall, he is a very, very small boy, something that you can definitely gather from Pikmin 1 due to the leaf sizes and all that. But I think now that we have some perspective with objects that we can relate to in real life, it helps emphasize that a whole lot more. I like it. A big difference this time around comes in the form of, of course, having two playable captains at all times that you can swap between whenever you want to. This allows for a much finer level of multitasking, where each captain can be doing completely different things on opposite sides of the map. That's great! It's certainly a whole lot better than, like, leaving Pikmin alone to do something and then you just hope you have your fingers crossed that they just won't die. I got trust issues after playing Pikmin 1, alright? This is a great change of pace. When playing on the different stages, it is arguably a lot better than the first game. There's no day limit like before, though there is still a time limit on a day-by-day -day basis, and it is still super satisfying maximizing your time, learning the best way to navigate the new obstacles that stand in your way. The Pikmin also just do a better job of following you. You know, back in Pikmin 1, man, they would just trip and you have to stand there and wait for them to gather themselves. Oh, that sucked. It's so much better now. I believe some of them do still trip from time to time, but it is nowhere near as bad. Thank goodness. Each day, once again, is also capped off by securing all of your Pikmin and leaving before the monsters come out to get some dinner. We get a report of all of our progress, we get to see how we did good and how we did badly, and now we get some email sent to us. Sometimes from Alamar's family, getting a better glance at what they look like in motion, Louie's grandmother, that's just kind of adorable, and the president's wife. A face that only the victim of loan sharks can love. Man, she's like really, really mean too. Almar, Almar got a good one, I'll give him that. Look how cute she is. I am so lonely, I want a friend that'll listen to my trouble. Oh my god, even Almar gets those local singles in his area. Good for him. And speaking of new ways to maximize your time, now there are these new plants that give out berries, and by collecting enough of them, you have access to special sprays. The Ultra Spicy Spray enhances your group's strength and speed for a little bit, and the Ultra Bitter Spray allows you to freeze an enemy in stone for about 10 seconds or so, making strong foes super easy to kill. They also make burp and fart sound effects, so that's nice. <laughs> Very good game, Mr. Miyamoto. Thank you so much. Glover, eat your heart out. Each area that you explore is also a bit of a remix of the levels from the first game. It doesn't really take much to see that you're basically exploring these same stages all over again, except this time there is a season attached to each one. Originality here would have definitely been nice, and there are plenty of differences to still make these levels stand out, but at least things here are much more visually interesting than before. However though, the game is really not about the core levels. It's all about... The Caves. The Caves. Two simple words that tore the complete fabric of the Pikmin fanbase in two. On one side, you got fans who are totally in contentment with this. They're just fine with it. It's whatever. The other side though... Oh. Oh, the simple act of being in a cave they hate now. It makes them wish for the sweet release of death. There really isn't much in between. I don't know why I'm talking about this in such an ominous tone. Ah, spread throughout each level are holes that lead to caves. Multi-floored stages where you can basically do the same Pikmin stuff that you've already been doing, but without the larger scope that the normal levels themselves provide. As well as no time limit, because as we all know, time doesn't progress underground. And now I do want to make this clear right off the bat that I do actually really like these. Each floor here is randomly generated, though the types of enemies and treasure that you find on each floor remain constant, meaning that each time you land in one, it is still up to you to figure out the best way to utilize your group of Pikmin to retrieve that floor's treasure and get to the end successfully. And on repeat playthroughs, you do have kind of a vague idea of what you're about to dive into. You also get rewarded at the end of these with some treasures that often give you power-ups. That is really awesome. One of the powers you get is the ability to pull Pikmin out of the ground with a whistle. 
Oh, it's about time they finally put that back in. Now, one of the biggest things to consider here is that you can't spawn any new Pikmin when you're inside the cave. So you really have to take the hazard warnings into account before diving in, and then you make the best with what you got. And joining you on your merry treasure-filled quest are the returning red, yellow, and blue Pikmin, acting basically the same as how they did before, although, instead of the yellows being able to use bomb rocks, which, again, that was weird in the first place, now they can handle electricity. That's a whole new can of worms right there I'll get to. This adventure then introduces us to three brand new Pikmin. Purple Pikmin, really thick boys that are super powerful. They cause shockwaves when they land on enemies, and they have the strength of 10 Pikmin when carrying items. But they're super slow, so sometimes using them can still be kind of annoying. The white Pikmin are super fast, great for carrying items and getting them back to your ship in no time. They can dig up items that are underground, that's cool. And they're also poisonous, causing damage to enemies that consume them. Lastly, there is the often forgotten Bulbman. What are, what am I looking at? They just pop up in caves from time to time, and then to get them, you have to kill the weird Pikmin bulb orb parent first, and then they suddenly see you and, they, and they're just cool with hanging around with you now. Okay. They don't really do anything special, they're just there for extra support but they are just the cutest abominations I ever did see. And transforming existing Pikmin into purple and white within caves is the only way to gain access to them. You can't grow any of them from the outside world. You can bring them back successfully, that's no problem. Sadly, the Bulbmen can't though. Why are they here? Okay, so at its core, the caves go against almost every single design philosophy that the original Pikmin set out to achieve in the first place. Rather than having these levels that feel like living, breathing environments, the caves just feel lifeless and they have this nonsensical level design that's surrounded by pure darkness, rarely changing up the aesthetics, and when it does, it's just... a uh, what? An above-ground, underground cave? Okay, that makes sense. It's nearly impossible to tell one cave apart from the other, and when you can, it's often for the wrong reasons. Like I very much remember this one room where they toss one of each big bulb orb at you. That's not memorable because it's good, that's memorable because I hate it. Sometimes enemies or straight up bombs fall out of the sky randomly, punishing you for trying to go ahead and multitask. Corridors are often too tight, making splitting up your group and trying to pull out specific Pikmin a pain. Some enemies here were clearly just designed to be annoying instead of challenging. Every elemental hazard that you run into just causes the Pikmin to scatter, very easy, you whistle them and you're good, except for the newly introduced electricity, which is constant insta-death. That's cool. The Water Wraith is by far one of the scariest things to grace video games in general, and the list just goes on. At least there are bread bugs now. That's kind of funny, it's literally a loaf of bread with a face. I like them. The music in the caves is really bizarre too. The outside areas all continue to sound like this really great atmosphere, but then you go into the caves and it's like... I mean, I don't hate it, but what? Everything all wrapped up together here often results in a frustrating experience where you need to utilize a skill set that is totally separate than that of trying to best yourself in the outside areas. Which is what Pikmin was about in the first place! At least if you do lose a Pikmin in the caves, and I'm gonna guarantee you here, you will lose a Pikmin in one of the caves, you can just restart at the floor that you were on, so... That's fine, but since all of the caves are once again randomly generated, you just gotta hope that you don't get screwed on the next attempt. Now to reiterate, I do enjoy playing these, but it's impossible to ignore all of these flaws. I only really enjoy these because, again, the act of playing Pikmin is a lot of fun. Doesn't matter what you're doing, taking your army and going out into battle, it's incredibly satisfying. And with 14 of these caves of varying lengths and difficulties, it makes for a much longer game too. You could almost say too long, it's over 10 plus hours now. On the one side, that's cool, a lot more Pikmin gameplay. On the other side, you could argue it overstays its welcome. I mean, hell, the game even has two endings based on progression. Not like Pikmin 1 where there are three endings, two of which are just based on how good you do. 
On your path to 100%, you will see the game end twice. Once you completely pay off your debt, which doesn't really take a whole lot of time, Alamo returns home, but forgets Louie. Because again, he clearly doesn't know what he's doing when he's behind the wheel. And of course, you're not gonna have Louie's blood on your hands today. You just return back to the planet, this time with the company president instead, and then you just keep doing what you were doing. Although you do get a really entertaining credit sequence with Louie trying to survive, I'll give the game that. That's that's pretty funny. I don't enjoy this whole big eye thing though. They just stare into my soul and quite frankly, it makes me uncomfortable. I understand the concept, I really do. It's neat that there is more gameplay after you complete the main goal. Like the fourth level is only unlocked after finishing your debt. But I feel like this could have been structured in a better way that doesn't just feel like padding. Is the selling point here now I can play as the company president? Woohoo! And I know I'm also now just complaining a whole lot, but realistically everything I talked about does end up feeling like a bunch of nitpicks. The game is still really fun to play and has some great highlights. Like for example, when you have a full group of Pikmin, they start to sing Eino Uta, which is arguably the series theme song. That nullifies every complaint I've had thus far. And the boss battles, once again, are pretty neat as well. At the very bottom of most of the caves, there is a battle against a new or returning unique monster. A good chunk of them are just evolved forms of existing enemies, so again, more originality would have been nice, but they're still cool. It does go against what I liked about Pikmin 1 not having dedicated boss levels because that's clearly what we have here, but I still enjoyed them, they're a good test of your skills. I always really loved when you defeated the Empress Bulblax and then it just sits there like, oh man, I shouldn't have eaten all those chicken nuggets. Eh, just another one of those beady long legs, no big deal here. Oh, never mind, it has a gun. How can this game be rated E when there's a spider with a gun? What is this, spider on PS1? This is a spider holding a knife and a gun. Technology's gone too far. Oh, oh, this boy just thick. The Emperor Bulblax actually shows up as a boss too. You know, the final boss from the first game. And he's stupid easy now. What a downgrade. Later on in the game, it even shows up as a regular enemy. Boy, how the mighty have fallen. Now, you can do the caves in any order that you want when you come across them, which is nice, but there is still a final boss. Down at the bottom of the dream den, we find Louie, held captive by this giant monstrosity, the Titan Dweevil. It's just this gigantic robotic spider that's able to spawn hazards of every element type, including electricity. The one hit kill wonder, that's cool. It's a really neat fight in concept that he's able to do everything that would cause any Pikmin harm, but the lack of balance between the hazards makes the battle super easy when you have just a group of yellows. Why go in with anything else? They're the only ones who can survive the insta-death. After taking him apart piece by piece, the Titan Dweevil is destroyed and Louis is saved. Only worth 10 Pocos too. I love it. And even then, technically the game still isn't over. It's only over when you get 100% of the treasure. One of which, and I always save this one for last, is this stupid dumbbell that requires 100 purple Pikmin. Need I remind you, the Pikmin that you can't get unless you go underground. Oh, and look at him go. Grease lightning. The game is just fighting me back at this point. We're treated to a much more cinematic ending than the last game as the Pikmin suddenly have the ability to glow. All right, that's cool. Alamar and crew make it back home peacefully. We get to go over our victories and our blunders. And then by diving into the menu, we have a secret cutscene showing that while Louis did claim to be ambushed by a giant monster, you know, the incident that caused the company dead in the first place, it was actually Louis's fault the whole time. The year of Louis is canceled. Pikmin 2 added a bunch of extra content as well. Now there is a full-on Piclopedia. You know how at the end of the first game there's that video that shows off every enemy in the game to really really cool music? Well now there is a glossary for every single enemy and item in the game with a description for each, from both captains. Olimar has these lengthy and detailed synopses, meanwhile Louie talks about how he'd cook them. Oh my god, <laughs> okay. The year of Louis is back on. Make a pate de foie gras from this massively obese creature's liver and spread it over a sesame cracker. Oh, that's gross. 
The challenge mode has made a glorious return as well, but it has been completely redone. Now it's entirely based on navigating the caves, giving you preset armies of Pikmin and a short time limit to get as much treasure as you possibly can, on top of retrieving the key and progressing onward. And a fun fact, that key was actually a removed element from the first game. Pretty cool we get to see that idea realized. I actually enjoy these more than the caves from the core game. The extra restrictions with the time limit and the preset Pikmin add a level of strategy to these that is definitely missing in the normal caves. And you can play them with a friend, splitting up the responsibilities between two people. Uh, that's really cool. And on top of that, something way better than the co-op in the challenge mode, there is a brand new two-player battle mode as well. It's you and your friend in a race to either gather four yellow marbles or steal your opponent's marble. Throughout each of the maps are enemies to take down or you can leave them for your friend to handle, as well as a bunch of cherries that when taken back to your ship will spin a roulette wheel to give you a random perk that could very well turn the tide of battle. This is an absolute blast. Now you can't take this mode too seriously, this isn't a pure competition of strategy, but when played with the right people, this has a Mario Kart-like quality of insanity going on. Oh, and I love it. Also, like if one player does really good over the other, their character just gets progressively more and more pissed off while yours gets more and more smug. This is amazing. And finally, the game did actually have e-reader support in Japan. Remember this thing? Probably not. This is actually true. Nintendo released Pikmin-themed e-reader cards for this thing, which unlocked a couple of minigames. Nothing too major, but it's just a pretty neat piece of Nintendo trivia. Maybe I'll talk about this thing one day. Eh, don't hold your breath. Now say what you will about Pikmin 2 and its transition into the more cave-style gameplay, one thing you can't argue here is that it's a much more well-rounded game overall. The adventure is much longer, there is a new level of charm with the branded treasure items as well as the Piclopedia and emails, extra reasons to pop the game back in for a few hours with some buddies. It's really great stuff. It still has plenty of what made the original Pikmin so much fun, but whether or not you enjoy the caves, it's not hard to argue that they take up just a bit too much of the game. Ultimately, I would easily replay Pikmin 1's main game over 2 any day. I appreciate them trying something new, but I think their priorities were just a bit misplaced. And for a while, that was it. That was all the Pikmin that anybody could play. Those first two games lasted everybody years. It took so long before Pikmin 3 finally entered our hands. It took far too long. At the very least, the first two games are super replayable, so it wasn't too hard to pop the game back in and go for a few hours. It was fine. Ah uh, yes, hello, person who thought the water rate was a good idea. It wasn't. Pikmin 1 and 2 started a pretty awesome franchise for the big N, Nintendo. Interestingly enough, the series almost falls in line with other Nintendo franchises, Mario, Zelda, and Metroid. Naturally, we have the first game, which introduced us to everything that this new universe has to offer, and then we have the second game, which does kinda do the same thing, but changes things up a whole bunch, just almost for the sake of it. Surely, after the success of both games, we're gonna get Pikmin 3 in no time. We didn't. Pikmin 2, 2004, Pikmin 3, 2013, wow, this is what true pain feels like. Miyamoto for some reason started talking about a brand new Pikmin game all the way back in 2007. Why talk about a game that early if you have nothing to show for it for years, and more importantly, why did he do it again? At least in the meantime, during that long wait, Pikmin was still kept somewhat relevant. Of course the Wii versions dropped, so that was cool. Captain Olimar became playable in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, and we got to see Captain Falcon then kill a bunch of Pikmin. 
Iconic. The Pikmin were responsible for transferring Wii data to the Wii U, a very underrated thing that Nintendo did there. And then the title that ushers the classic response, oh yeah, that game, Nintendo Land. There was a Pikmin attraction here where you get to fight robotic forms of Pikmin enemies, and then if you played with someone else, they would be a Pikmin, and then you'd play with other Pikmin. It was really weird seeing like a me as a Pikmin alongside the rest of the Pikmin. He's just trying to fit in. It's just, it was a weird, it was a very weird thing. But in terms of enjoyment, it was about as neat as any game in Nintendo Land could be. The thing is though, it wasn't Pikmin 3, the game that everybody really wanted. It certainly did lead to an interesting development cycle, but hey, after years of waiting, we finally got it. Pikmin 3, easily one of the biggest games Nintendo released for the Wii U. Just like, marginally better than Devil's Third. Nintendo was so confident with what they were working on, it even started an E3 conference. This was the hardcore game that was meant to show off the potential of the Wii U gamepad. They were so serious about it, man. Miyamoto almost killed a Pikmin. What a monster. Just kidding. He's adorable. I love this man. I feel just like a purple Pikmin. So yeah, I think you guys have been waiting long enough. The third Pikmin adventure is finally here, and I'm excited to talk about it. Welcome back to Ala March, everybody. Okay, it's not, it's not March anymore. I, I didn't really plan that far ahead. I didn't think that name would kind of take off. Uh, I've made a huge mistake. Um, Al, it's Alfpril now. Alf, Alfpril. Pikmin 3. Yep, yep, uh-huh, okay, yeah, this game is gonna be pretty. Rather than straight up continuing the life and times of Captain Olimar, the story now revolves around the planet of Kopai, currently in a crisis, unable to find any food to feed their booming population. The inhabitants also only eat fruit, so in an attempt to try to find food across multiple planets and failing, the game says that all of their results ended up being fruitless. Oh man, that's good. However, they did find one planet, PNF-404, aka the same planet from the previous two games, aka Earth. Three explorers are sent off to the planet, and to be expected, something goes wrong during the descent. It wouldn't be a Pikmin game without some near-death experiences. Our lovely captains this time around come in the form of the sprightly young engineer Alf, the adorable botanist Brittany, and the captain with a, quite frankly, amazing mohawk, Charlie. After everybody crash lands, you're given some time with Charlie and Alf to reacquaint yourself with the Pikmin and learn some of the game's new mechanics, but really the first thing you're probably gonna do is just mess around in the water for a little bit. Man, man the jump to high definition shows, this looks amazing. That Mario guy on Miiverse, he really knew what he was talking about. Before long, Alf meets up with Brittany, and shortly after that, Charlie re-enters the fray as well. And between the three of them, my favorite is easily Brittany. I love, I love her to pieces. Not only is she adorable, but she's kind of a savage. They don't call me the keen engineer for nothing. Nobody calls you that. I know. I think I found the one. I gotta give it to her though, her smack talk may be warranted. He may not be Olimar, but he certainly drives like him. With your Pikmin army in tow, the adventure this time calls for the retrieval of every single piece of fruit that you can come across in order to convert it to juice and bring it back to your home planet, as well as sustain yourself on a day-by-day -day basis on your trip. And like, speaking of the fruit, it has absolutely no reason why it looks so damn stupid good in this game. I don't get it. It's something that I still don't understand why this is some of the best looking models to ever grace a gaming, a period. Look at the grapes! And you can really tell that they are graphically intensive too. The game's frame rate can barely handle the juice that you squeeze out of them. All right, now I know the Wii U was underpowered, but this is ridiculous. It takes the smoothness of the rest of the game and then just beats it to a pulp. I, I don't understand it quite honestly, but to me, I prefer my games like I like my orange juice with no pulp. You know, I, I, I knew that was a bad joke going in, uh, but I'm gonna keep it anyway. Also, I think this orange juice has gone bad, so I'm not, I'm not gonna drink it. Yeah, it's bad. 
So Pikmin 3 took many years to finally get in our hands, and honestly, it does show. With a simple click of the button on the gamepad, you can see the world around you in first person and take pictures. Yeah, it's uh, it is super pretty. And you get to see the lifeless eyes of every individual Pikmin, it's breathtaking. This third adventure takes what worked in the first two adventures, avoids what didn't work, and polishes up everything to an incredible degree. First and foremost, the caves? Totally gone. Let me get a yeehaw on that one. Now we get to explore completely original and unique lands, and they are huge in size. Sure, on the surface here, we have just a typical snow level, but you take a deep trip inside of the non-underground caves, and you find these really threatening monsters and hazards that you wouldn't see coming. Mechanically, so many tweaks were made to the established formula to simply improve your quality of life. First off, the stars of the show, the Pikmin army themselves. The purple and white Pikmin from game 2 are now absent, and you know what, fair enough, the strength of the purple undermined one of the perks of the red, and the usefulness of the white Pikmin was incredibly situational, so I get not prioritizing bringing them back. Now what we have is each Pikmin presenting pros and cons that are completely unique to themselves. Oh, and that, uh, that electricity garbage from Pikmin 2, where it instantly kills you every single time? Now it just stuns the Pikmin, like everything else does. Thank goodness. But of course, we do have some new additions to the family as well. First up, there are the Rock Pikmin. These guys are, uh, well... Rocks. Their hard exterior allows them to destroy glass objects, they're resistant to being crushed, and they are powerful like the reds are, however, they can't latch onto enemies like the others can. Also, they're just really cute. Like literally, it's just a rock with some googly eyes on it and then a plant stem on top, and I approve 100%. And then we have the winged Pikmin. Oh my goodness, they're cute too. As expected, these can fly, they can float over water, they carry items back to your ship by hovering, sometimes taking shortcuts that other Pikmin can't, but they are slower when doing so. They're weaker too, definitely not meant for combat. Now I know what you all may be asking, well what about the Bulbamin? I know everyone's fan favorite, those little weird looking guys. Them, as well as the purple and whites, are nowhere to be found because you gotta remember, those guys you can only get from going into the underground caves. No underground caves, no Pikmin. Simple mathematics, really. Oh. Oh, he actually finished them. This group of five Pikmin feels a whole lot more well-rounded than before. Yet again, each one has their unique sets of ups and downs, and it really adds to the level of strategy required to tackling the day in front of you. The world around you also makes sure to specialize each Pikmin's strength at least a couple different ways. What if you find yourself in a large underwater section with a bunch of fish enemies? Easy, now the blue Pikmin can swim towards their foes. Ah, uh, what about this room here? It's just a bit, just a bit too dark. That's okay, just connect some electrical wires with the yellow Pikmin, and there you go. Of course though, strategy is once again the name of the game, and there are so many new things to consider on top of the Pikmin's strengths and weaknesses. Now you can charge into enemies and obstacles, perfect if you know you can take them down quickly. The Pikmin can now latch onto specific body parts of enemies when thrown, such as the Bulborb's eyes, which does stun them more than how you would typically fight them by tossing the Pikmin on their back. Every type can now carry bomb rocks, that's just cool. You'll often come across piles of different material pieces, and instead of needing one Pikmin per item, you can just leave a couple of them there, and they're finally smart enough to be able to bring those items to their destination, go back and get more, and keep doing that until there's no more left. And this goes for the berries as well, which once again you can make super spicy spray with. I am just so proud of them, man. They have finally stopped being super idiotic. And when everything is said and done and it's time to round up the army, now every single Pikmin stays under one onion, just for an extra level of convenience. Oh yeah, those jiggle physics. Some suit upgrades can be found in the wild, those are cool, they give you some new abilities. And then there are the boss battles, they are bigger and grander than ever before, and I love all of them. Unfortunately, in my opinion, the bosses do have their own unique boss arenas, they're not necessarily integrated with the rest of the world like they were in Pikmin 1, but hey, I can acknowledge that I was like the only person ever to say that was a good part of the first game, that's fine. The bosses are still cool, I'm just, I'm just saying. Oh, and you thought that guy was big in Pikmin 2? Look at the absolute unit, the quaggled Myerclops is. That scared the hell out of me the first time I fought it. Some of these bosses may in fact be too imposing at first for you, but that's okay. Now, the bosses retain their damage even if it takes you more than one day to defeat them. Again, just another level of convenience.
But arguably the biggest change yet, there is a rubber ducky that stays inside the captain's ship. Wait, no. Arguably the biggest change here yet is instead of the captains just being a means to get Pikmin where they need to be, now on top of chucking the Pikmin around, you can chuck your partners around too to get them across platforms a whole lot easier. And hey, you know what? I know exactly where you're thinking now. How is it possible to manage three captains at the same time? Well, don't you worry your pretty little head. The answer to that is the answer to all of life's questions, the Wii U gamepad. With this second screen experience, you can now guide captains to specific spots on the map while you go do something else. And honestly, as cool as that level of micromanagement is, it does suck that this is limited to the gamepad. If you end up using the gamepad itself as the controller, then fine, but I've said this before, the Wiimote and Nunchuck is the way to play Pikmin, and it sucks that I have to keep going back and forth with the gamepad in order to come up with the best strategy. Or you know what, maybe you're just saying screw it and you want to use the game's touch controls. Yeah, you remember that? Of course you don't. For some sick, insane reason, Nintendo added touchscreen controls to Pikmin as well, and they're not bad, but why? This is truly the symbol for the dark times. On top of the management of the captains, there are also often these cutscenes where the in-game characters who have their own gamepad contact each other with video feeds. The TV then duplicates the display that you find on the gamepad, just way smaller. You can still read it, but it's lame. Blame Nintendo for this one, man. The more Wii U games that get ported to the Switch, the more useless this piece of plastic feels. So at this point, assuming that you're doing your homework, we can all assume that Pikmin 3 is mainly just more or less more of Pikmin 1. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. Pikmin 2 was split between emulating Pikmin 1 down to reusing similar locations and doing something kind of original with the dungeon crawling elements of the caves. While here in Pikmin 3, this is clearly a massive jump, although it does stick to the original formula. Huge, gorgeous locations that not only look way better, but they're also a whole lot more atmospheric. The size of these levels also leads to an adventure that is a whole lot longer than the first game, but doesn't feel mostly like padding like the second game. There's a stronger emphasis on strategy and diversity between the Pikmin types, and something else that definitely shouldn't be understated, Pikmin 3 is actually a narratively driven game too. Instead of getting your goal at the start of the game and then that's it, now you have constant motivation. First off, you gotta find your partners. After that, you're on the search for... Oh man, THE Captain Olimar, who apparently has the cosmic drive key, the part that's required to return back home. However, all of the signals that are leading you to Olimar's location... Oh, oh no, it's him. Oh, and he's in danger too. Oh, of course he is. Alright, I guess we'll save him. Surely nothing bad will come from this. Oh no, Louis exploded. Once we save him again, we learn that Olimar was actually sent back to the planet to find more treasure to buy back the SS Dolphin, the ship from the first game. Apparently all of the money that we made in Pikmin 2 still wasn't enough. Wow, that sucks. And naturally, in typical Olimar fashion, he crashes his ship on the descent. This guy, this guy, he, he should learn how to drive. Come to find out, after his crash landing, he was then taken captive by this mysterious creature, the Plasm Wraith. And yeah, it's not gonna give him up super easily. For some reason, it's very motherly towards Olimar. It's a little odd, but okay. You do very quickly get Olimar back, but this then leads to a super duper stressful final level where you're running away from a slowly crawling Plasm Wraith you're solving puzzles and defeating enemies along the way, all the while trying to successfully carry Olimar back to your ship. And dude, I, I, I love this. This last day or so of puzzle solving is super intense, and it's something that we didn't really get to experience in the last two games. Pikmin 1 just had that really short level before the boss, and then 2 had a really, really big boss, but it was at the end of yet another cave. Here we have a proper test of every single skill and strategy that we've worked with for the entire adventure. It's awesome. Eventually, you escape the giant tree that you were trapped inside of, which naturally leads to a final battle with the huge shiny monster itself. Similar to the Titan's Weevil before it, it can attack every single Pikmin type with one of its moves, but it is much more balanced this time around thanks to the electricity not being insta-death. 
that really changes a whole lot about the game as a whole. I wasn't lying. This means you can probably go into this fight with a single Pikmin type, but you're not totally screwed if you go in with a varied lineup. The only real problem here is that the fight goes on for quite a while. It's a whole lot of just hoping to get as many of these gold bits eliminated before he sucks them right back in. But after what feels like forever, and like everything else on this planet, it goes down in a blob of glory. And with that, Captain Olimar is saved. Oh man, and that's right, Olimar can talk too. I have yet to mention it in this marathon, but I love how deep Olimar's voice is. <laughs> No one would ever expect it to be that deep, it's so good. We get given back our cosmic drive key, offer Olimar and Louie a trip back to their home planet, and the adorable Pikmin say their goodbyes once again, ending Pikmin 3. And dude, the credits are so good. I've said it multiple times so far, but really words alone don't describe just how beautiful this game is. And getting to see the Pikmin just having a good time in their environments, it's so charming. Ah, would you look at that? Looks like the plot line to Pikmin 4. Oh, who am I kidding? We're never getting Pikmin 4. So yeah, Pikmin 3. This game is pretty fantastic. The wait was totally worth it. Now, I am hugely nostalgic for the first game, much like a lot of you people out there. But honestly, this is probably the best game in the series yet. It just has love and care put into it from start to finish. It's a damn good game. Oh, but of course, we're not done yet. If you thought Pikmin 2 had really good side content, oh, you haven't seen anything yet. Sadly, the Piklopedia is gone. One of my favorite parts of Pikmin 2, just not here. There's also no equivalent of hearing any of the captain's thoughts on specific monsters. But what we have instead is a massively improved challenge mode and an even better multiplayer mode. Now titled Mission Mode, it is similar to what we got in Pikmin 1. You are once again challenged with getting as much stuff done as you can within a time limit. However, now we have completely original maps to work with, not the ones from the main game. We even get access to the purple and white Pikmin here too. This is all in good fun. Who cares about the deep lore of them being underground exclusive at this point? The best part about this mission mode is you are given the perfect amount of time to deal with these challenges. Whether you're collecting treasure or defeating enemies, you gotta be moving at all times if you wanna get a good score. And just when you thought things were looking too good, they get even better. This game had downloadable content. They added five more maps with completely unique themes. There's a festive house, a rust yard, a cavern that features side-scrolling sections, a large factory with conveyor belts, and making its grand return, the forest naval from Pikmin 1. I had no idea that's what the map was when going into it, and I was so happy to see it return. Now I just want Pikmin 1 HD. This is gorgeous. I want more of this. And yes, just like Pikmin 2, this can be done in co-op as well. You once again split up the responsibilities between two captains, and it's a lot of fun. But let's just say you would rather get into an argument with your friend instead of working with them. Dude. Dude. Introducing Bingo Battle, one of the greatest multiplayer modes Nintendo has ever devised. Not only are we once again dealing with completely original maps, but instead of simply collecting a bunch of marbles like you did in Pikmin 2, now you have to complete a line, any line, on your randomly scattered bingo card. And of course, the cherries are back too, giving you the opportunity to unleash hell upon your opponent. Similar to the battle mode in Pikmin 2, you gotta play this with the right people. You can't take this too seriously. This is just a bunch of nonsensical fun. However, there is still a perfect blend of randomness with the bingo placements, as well as strategy since you can still screw over the other player by getting an item that you don't need, but you know they need. Do you happen to know the location of their last item, but they don't know where it is? Huh, yeah man, that's, that's really weird. Sorry, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I haven't found it either. I could go on for hours about how good Bingo Battle is and how it's just the cherry on top of an already fantastic package. And actually, when I think about it, that analogy that I used earlier fits here too. You got Game 1, The Originator, Game 2, The Different One, and continuing on with this trend, Game 3, nearly perfecting the original formula. All across the board, Pikmin 3 is a gem. Now there may be some little nitpicks here and there, but to me, I couldn't really think up of anything. Now it is purely subjective which Pikmin game is your favorite, but in terms of just overall quality, yeah, I think this one is the best. And it's not just because I think I have a thing for Britney. 
Uh, I'm just saying, you know, she should have been playable in Smash and not that weird Olimar cosplayer, but that's just, that's just me. Now, at the time of this video, that's it. That's the main series Pikmin games. One, two, and three, and that's it. Pikmin 4 does apparently exist. I doubt it. Uh, Miyamoto keeps saying it every year, just driving me, quite frankly, insane. But regardless of that, we're not done with the Pikmin franchise just yet, because when you least expected it, a 3DS game. Huh. All right. Well, next time on the Pikmin Marathon, next time on Alf Prill, hey you Pikachu! The Pikmin Trilogy, what a fantastic set of games they are. For a company that is often criticized for rarely creating big new IP, Nintendo developed quite an awesome universe about gathering up a plant-like army and strategizing with them to collect treasure and take down huge threatening insects. Sure, we did have to wait a while for Pikmin 3, but looking at all the final products, yeah man, it's, it's great stuff. Now Pikmin 4 is on the way, if, if we're to believe the prophecy, but until then, you know, at least, at least we have Pikmin short movies. Yeah, you know, you can't, you can't forget about this just randomly dropping on the Wii U and 3DS eShops. These were actually pretty cool. What we have here are three scenarios totaling roughly 20 minutes of animation, and it is really the first time that we get to see just a huge amount of charm that this universe can offer. I mean, like, one of the episodes is about the Pikmin fearing for their life because they think that Olimar is about to eat them, uh, so I don't, I don't know if that one is charming, necessarily, but aside from that, yeah, yeah, super charming. They use the Pikmin license without insulting the fan base. I know, such a rarity. I could watch hours and hours of this stuff. This is the sort of thing that Nintendo should do more often. Okay, that, that was pretty awesome. So while Pikmin 4 remains in purgatory, Nintendo went ahead and gave us another game, this time on the 3DS. I'm pretty confident in saying this is a game that absolutely nobody asked for, so uh... This, this was a nice gift from them, I guess. Welcome back to Alf Pearl, everybody. Today we're taking a look at, so far, the only portable Pikmin game. It's also the last time I have to say Alf Pearl, so... That's, that's really good news. Yeah, so like, did any, did anybody play this game? It released months into the Switch's life, so at that point, I think people stopped caring about 3DS games, but uh... Hey, you know, Pikmin hasn't really done me wrong just yet, let's, let's see how this first spinoff in the series fares. This adventure was developed by Arzest, as opposed to being in-house Nintendo like the others. Yeah, those are the same people who made everybody's favorite 3DS game, Yoshi's New Island. People really like to rag on this game, but I don't know, I, I kinda liked it. It's not terrible, but ultimately it still doesn't leave for an awesome track record for the company. Now though, with Pikmin, this is a totally different style of game, so I guess we can go in with completely different expectations. This is something that's gonna be completely new and original, and we should go into it expecting as much. The story this time revolves around Olimar driving into a meteor and crash landing onto a planet. Oh my god, are you kidding me? This, this is his job, isn't it? Isn't his whole job to be like, oh, he has to go deliver things. He works for a freight company. You know, I, I figure that his eyes were just a design choice, but now I legitimately think that he just has them closed at all times. This incredibly bad habit of his is so iconic that crashing his ship is literally his final smash. But okay, after we get past that little bit, the story is super basic. 
you crash land onto the planet, and you need to refill your fuel tank by collecting a whole bunch of this new substance, Sparklium, and find the missing component that allows your ship to return home. And at this point, you know, I would kind of figure that Hokutate Fright would have some sort of like insurance, workers' compensation, you know, something to help its employees out, uh, but maybe, maybe they're still paying off their debt. Um, that's, that's all I got. So, if you know a thing or two about portable Nintendo games, you may remember Kirby Mass Attack. <laughs> of course you do. It's that one Kirby game where tons of people said that the gameplay style could probably work as a Pikmin game. Well, clearly somebody listened, because instead of converting the traditional Pikmin gameplay to a portable console, we have our first ever 2D side-scrolling Pikmin adventure. Now, inherently, this eliminates a lot of what made Pikmin great in the first place. Rather than dealing with full, expansive worlds, we are working with a more traditional level format, where your primary goal is to simply get from point A to point B, as well as explore just a little bit to search for some treasure. It's also one of the few 3DS games that goes for the original DS thing of splitting up the gameplay between both screens, instead of relegating one to like a map or something. And I gotta give the game credit here, this is one of my favorite things about the DS line of systems. As a result of this shift in gameplay, there is next to no level of strategy here. Each stage has you start with zero Pikmin, with the maximum potential being 20, and the types that you have access to are preset, as the gimmicks and hazards that you come across are built to use specific Pikmin. You never have to worry about choosing who goes in your army like you do in the other games. <laughs> also, that's not his voice! His voice is way deeper than that. Ah, <laughs> uh, 0 out of 10, not faithful enough to the deep Pikmin lore. Despite these changes though, the core idea kinda remains the same. You work with what you're handed and you gotta practice quick reflexes in order to thrive and survive. And also have a mastery of the touchscreen controls, that is a thing as well. And I have to say, it's actually pretty satisfying. Similar to using the Wiimote in the other games where you point at where you want the Pikmin to go and then throw them there, it's almost just as satisfying to tap the screen and then see them fly there. Even though we're working with only two dimensions now, it still feels pretty good. This time around, our army consists of the Pikmin 3 crew with no real changes. There are the reds for fire, yellows for electricity and higher platforms, blues for water, rocks for glass, and winged for flying. Still no Bulbamin though, Re rest in peace. So with no real reason to keep your mind active at all times, the game instead tries to have variety by using the platformer approach of giving each stage a bit of a unique theme. Some of them are returning from earlier games, and some of them brand new. There's picking up and using bombs, there's dealing with specific enemies that tower over you, being held by winged Pikmin in a windstorm, that's one of my favorite parts of the whole game, getting attacked from fire shooting enemies from off in the background. It's all pretty neat stuff, but the question is, is it fun? Uh, kinda? With no strategy, and not even much in the way of challenge, it almost feels as if the developers wanted to show off a bunch of cool ideas that they managed to cook up, rather than put you in front of obstacles that you're meant to overcome. Any substantial challenge comes from trying to keep your Pikmin alive, though it's not even that huge of a hassle since some parts of the level will just restock you anyway. Unless you get screwed right at the very end, which to be fair, is very possible, chances are pretty high that you'll end the level with the 20 maximum Pikmin. It's also pretty hard to care about them all that much when... Mm! Okay, so I cannot tell if this was intentional or not, but what was initially a joke in their debut, the bread bugs have become the face of absolute fear and despair. Okay, am I crazy? Am I crazy? I could have sworn that I nailed it. It's the damnedest thing, man. The game honestly has pretty solid hit detection all around, except for these carbohydrate insect tools. Oh man, a loaf of bread with a face that tries to play tug of war with the items. Ha ha ha, that's so cute. Now we make them the worst thing ever. <sighs> at least, at least the rest of the animals that you come in contact with are pretty cool. You got a whole bunch of new and returning foes, and they fit the revamped 2D Pikmin style just fine. And that goes for the bosses as well. At the end of each of the game's eight worlds is a large boss fight. Honestly, they're, they're pretty stupid easy. They have one super easy pattern that takes no time to discover, and then they go down in like a minute or two. It's a shame, really. You almost feel bad for them. They don't have a chance. But, to be fair, I guess if losing Pikmin to the breadbugs drives me to the brink of insanity, 
I almost prefer knowing that I can take these guys out in no time. You get rewarded for completing stages with no lost Pikmin, so the less crap that keeps me in the way for my gold star, the better. Ultimately, Hey Pikmin does a whole lot different, but there is still enough here that got translated over that it still does feel like a Pikmin game. Graphically, it looks okay. You know, not too terrible. They worked with what they got. There's some pretty solid lighting effects in a few levels. That was pretty nice to see. Uh, the soundtrack, also not too bad. Some catchy melodies. It's not as crazy as Pikmin 2's cave music was, but it's pretty good. The worst part about the entire package is the frame rate is shockingly poor. I will tell you this right now. Do not play this game if you only have an original 3DS. Somehow the game chugs on the original model, which is super disappointing. If you play this on any of the new 3DSs, it does still have some frame rate drops here and there, but it is at least playable. Nobody really expected a 2D Pikmin game to ever exist, but what we ended up getting... It's... it's fine. It almost feels uninteresting to talk about. The game's just okay. You know, I see people hate this game a lot, but I think that's just because the game is different, therefore it's bad. But if you actually play it, it's alright. I, I had a good enough time with it. Despite doing some things that are pretty new, it also kind of feels safe at the same time. You have definitely never played something quite like it except for Kirby Mass Attack, but even then, you kind of know what to expect. Easily, my favorite part of the entire adventure is in an effort to make the Pikmin more charming than ever, you are bombarded with a bunch of short cutscenes that show off the little plant-like creatures just doing something cute. There are a ton of these, and sometimes even Olimar is involved. You honestly can't go five minutes of gameplay without seeing at least one of them, and you could argue that this is to make up for the repetitive gameplay, since when you do come across them, they're not skippable. And I think the intention was to have you forget that the game is basically exactly the same from title screen to credits. So, uh, yeah, I, gu I guess they have a purpose. But even still, I loved these. I noticed that some people weren't really a fan of them, but I'm just a sucker for these cute little things. And since they just sit there being adorable in the main games, it's actually pretty cool to show off a bit of personality. Big fan. And aside from dealing with some repetition, the only problem that I have here is accessing the secret levels. You see, each world has four main levels and a boss fight, but within one of the normal levels, you can find a secret exit. But rather than truly rewarding exploration and experimentation, they are often sitting almost right next to the normal exits, meaning you have to play the levels in question at least twice if you want to get 100% completion. It's not Chibi Robo Ziplash levels of stupid stage progression, but but it still, still kind of sucks. Aside from that, again, the game is pretty much fine and inoffensive. I would go as far to say it's good. So if you remember correctly, Olimar's goal is to gather a whole lot of sparklium. Levels are filled to the brim with it. The treasure that you find give you a few hundred upon collection. There are these really short extra levels that are meant to just overload you with the stuff. There's this Pikmin Park thing where all of the Pikmin that you've gathered on your adventure can be sent off to retrieve even more. A casual playthrough will give you the required amount by like halfway through, so you'll you'll be fine. As you progress to your goal, you get some upgrades too, but they're all pretty minor. It's mainly just all a stopgap before getting to the ultimate goal of retrieving the vital ship part. After traversing through eight sectors of everything trying to kill you, you're eventually led to the final stretch, the fragment of hope. So menacing. Here, we're greeted with the massive plant creature, the Berserk Leech Hydro. T Damn, what a name. It's still, it's still pretty easy. But I gotta say, going back to the whole two screen thing, it does a wonder for these boss fights. They offer a sense of scale that is almost parallel to Pikmin 3, I would go as far as to say. And this massive thing, I mean, man, that's, he's gigantic. But no matter how much I praise it, it is a very simple fight. You got a couple of phases, a lot of throwing Pikmin, and then it's defeated. As it turns out, the creature was actually just a normal plant transformed into a monster after being taken over by this parasitic leech that has been altered by the Sparklium Converter, the item that we've been looking for all this time. Cute. Now if you excuse me, Olimar, do yo dance! With your ship finally repaired, you and the Pikmin get to celebrate. You then say goodbye once again, Olimar ascends into the heavens and returns to his home planet peacefully, ending Hey Pikmin. There aren't really many extras in this one. There is amiibo support where you can collect Mario, Animal Crossing, and Splatoon figurines as treasure in the game after scanning them in. 
that's that's kind of cool. And we do sort of have the return of the Piclopedia in the form of just simple data logs. And man, whoever whoever wrote these up really needs a promotion. This blue pellet creates blue Pikmin. Makes sense. I find them near water a lot, which also lines up. All right, that's he's very observant. Their big eyes suggest that they have excellent vision, while the puckered lips indicate that they're good kissers. All right, I think I think Olimar misses his wife. Maybe if I keep observing its behavior, I can begin to understand why my wife has a hard time throwing anything away. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. I still can't figure out if it's shy or if it's desperately seeking attention. Yeah, you may as well just go ahead and change that description from male sheer grub to, to YouTuber. So yeah, Hey Pikmin's a pretty okay game. Definitely not as terrible as everyone else would have you make it out to be. You know, with a franchise as successful as Pikmin, a spinoff was inevitable, whether we wanted one or not. And for what it's worth, it's okay. If you have a specifically new model 3DS, it couldn't hurt. It'll, it'll tide you over before Pikmin 4 never releases. And thankfully, it's already been confirmed that despite Miyamoto talking about Pikmin 4 before Hey Pikmin was announced, this game is not the game that Miyamoto was referring to. That does in fact mean that at some point in the probably distant future, we will continue this Pikmin marathon with Pikmin 4. That game exists. It's totally gonna happen. We swear. It's never gonna happen, is it? Hey everyone, before we get into things, if you missed the recent announcement, my second channel, Ant Dude Plays, is back up and running. And it's gonna be the home for looser, more lightly edited content that'll be uploaded a lot more frequently. So if you want more stuff to watch in between these bigger Ant Dude episodes, that is the place for you. Already got some videos on there with plenty more on the way, so stay tuned and thanks for your support. Time to talk about Pikmin. Ah, would you look at that? Looks like the plot line to Pikmin 4. Oh, who am I kidding? We're never getting Pikmin 4. We will continue this Pikmin marathon with Pikmin 4. That game exists. It's totally gonna happen. We swear. It's never gonna happen, is it? I'll never complain about anything ever again. I'm still not convinced Pikmin 4 actually exists, man. I've beaten this game, okay? I've seen the title screen, I pressed a bunch of buttons for hours, and then the credits rolled, and even still, I'm just gonna keep falling back to that 2015 article about the game nearing completion and joke about it never releasing. That's, that's all I know. But, negative. All jokes aside, it is 2023 and, here it is! Pikmin 3 originally released on the Wii U in 2013. It's been- it- it- it's been 10 years! Almost to the day, too. July 13th for 3 in Japan, July 21st for 4 worldwide. Oh, oh wow. Man, a wait like that? It can only be rivaled by, like, Kingdom Hearts 3? But hell, at least before then, fans got these incredibly divisive handheld games to keep them busy. Oh. We're really gonna keep talking trash about Hey Pikmin when it brought us the crumb bug? Come on. The wait to get to this point has been excruciating. It didn't help that when the game was first revealed, Miyamoto gave us a tease out of direct and then said, oh no, we're gonna talk about Bloom instead. That was mean. That was mean and I still don't forgive him. At the very least, the past couple years, they have been pretty fruitful. Yes, that was an intentional pun. Dude, the Pikmin fans kept taking over Times Square in New York City. You guys... <laughs> you guys are amazing. Back when I previously talked about the Pikmin series with my oh-so-cleverly titled themed months of Alamarch and Alfprol, still clever names by the way, it was all around the time rumors were starting to circulate about a Switch port of Pikmin 3. Well, it took well over a year after that last video went out, but hey, Pikmin 3 Deluxe. This release is actually very important to the context of Pikmin 4, because for many people, this was their very first introduction to the series. And boy, this can also easily be argued as the Wii U to Switch port with the most amount of changes. Everything's been consolidated to one screen now, meaning you no longer have to look at a separate device to see the map finally. We got difficulty options, multiple save states, achievements with the badge system, the Piccolopedia from Pikmin 2 is back, story mode can be played in 
co-op. All of the original DLC is included, and there is a brand new slate of side story missions where you get to play as Olimar before and after the events of the main story. There's a lot. There's a lot of stuff here. There's a whole range of other smaller changes too, but content-wise, Deluxe is clearly the best way to play that game. Even though they did randomly update the Switch's icon to change the logo to match what they are going forward with with 4 and the releases of 1 and 2 on Switch, but... okay. Finally, less flowers. Now Pikmin will sell more. However, the controls end up being a more interesting conversation. For the longest time, I used to champion the Wii Remote controls hardcore for these games. Clearly, they're the best way to play them, right? The precision and the ability to move your captain and the cursor independently simply could not be matched with just analog sticks. Thankfully, gyro aiming does provide a perfect middle ground where you can do big movements with the analog stick and be more precise with the motion controls. It's still a shame that gyro technology is not as precise as the pointer technology we had 15 years ago, but man, you know what? Considering all of the other quality of life improvements that Deluxe brought to the table, I will still take this over kinking my neck constantly to look at the gamepad any day. But this controller topic is definitely further exacerbated with the Switch ports of Pikmin 1 and 2, used to celebrate the upcoming release of Pikmin 4. And yeah, there's gyro in these versions because they're based off of the Wii versions, but it's only when you're throwing a Pikmin or using the whistle, so not as fluid. You're not able to point anywhere and everywhere like in the Wii versions or in 3 Deluxe, because as it turns out, Pikmin 4 would take on that same exact control scheme. So, yeah, it all makes sense now. So for 1 and 2, I'm still not a huge fan of the GameCube versions, I adore the Wii versions, and I do accept that the Switch versions are likely the definitive ones now. Still great controls, minor improvements to how the game handles, brand new videos for the enemy roll call at the end of Pikmin 1, newly rendered cutscenes for Pikmin 2, just having these games portable? Dude, the Switch now has the entire main Pikmin quadrilogy available on it, and that just makes me so damn happy. Any complaints I have are just null and void because this is a great time for Pikmin fans. Hey, never mind, they got rid of the Duracell batteries in Pikmin 2. You know, okay, I take, I take it back, the Switch versions are terrible. It's probably best for consistency if I cover all my bases first before we finally get to talk about this seminal title. Uh, there was Pikmin Bloom. I mean, that that happened, uh, you know, it, it, it seemed like it'd be a great success after Pokemon Go, but I just, I can't be bothered. There's only so many times I can walk around and, and bloom Pikmin that it just gets tiring. Even though I did get the Ochi costume. The Ochi costume's nice. And also, doi, how stupid of me. When I made that video on Hey Pikmin, you know, the 3DS game, I forgot to mention the 3DS Pikmin killer app. Photos with Pikmin. Where you can take photos of the Pikmin. Listen, if I didn't talk about everything before talking about Pikmin 4, I would be called a Pikmin fraud. And I'm never gonna allow that to happen, okay? Never again! Alright, no more fooling around. It's time for the main event. I can't believe I'm gonna be saying this, but... Let's talk about Pikmin... 4! You guys see all those great review scores for the game, except for GameSpot 7 out of 10, stating that only the Dandori segments were the negative? Seems like a uh, genuine Dandori issue, that's all I'm saying. Going into this brand new adventure, there was one major concern from the community. Are the events of Pikmin 4 retconning the events of the previous games? Are we really caring about the deep Pikmin continuity now? So things start off telling the story of Olimar crashing a ship and finding a Pikmin, but see, it mentions him discovering the Pikmin as if they're brand new things. And also there's a dog this time, Moss. I don't like how she's looking at me. Quite frankly, Olimar's probably hit his head so many times during these ship crashes, his memory could just be playing tricks on him. Soon enough, the real plot shows itself. As a member of the Rescue Corps, which also crashed on the planet, dear God, invest in some ship R&D. It is up to you, as your own created character, a series first, and I love this so much, to find and rescue not only Captain Olimar, but the rest of your crew, as well as dozens and dozens of other castaways. I guess this is kind of a retcon of Pikmin 1, perhaps this slips the game's story before the events of 2 and 3, but Honestly, that was never a concern of mine. Your ship crashes, you can grow these little guys to collect a bunch of stuff, deal with a little bit of nightmare fuel. It's still a Pikmin game at the end of the day. Where it fits in the timeline, that... what, whatever. There are also these three castaways that you find that I guess are related to the captains from 3. They look the same, they have the same color scheme, but they're not the same characters. I... I don't know, maybe that means something? At the end of the day, if any story implications change the course of the franchise going forward, I don't really care. 
as long as we don't have to wait another 10 years for the next game. If anything, I'm more satisfied by the decision to add a full cast of characters to the Pikmin universe, finally. Before, the cast of characters never really developed beyond, oh hey, these guys are from a different planet than Hakatate. The company has a president now that goes, <laughs> Olimar gets adorable little messages from his wife who almost looks exactly like him, and I don't know, that's kind of weird when you think about it, it looks exactly like him but with different hair, that's, that's weird, but hey, you do you. But here, yeah, we got a whole crew. The new head captain, Shepard, the gear inventor, Russ, the badass dingo, Colin. And that doesn't include all of the other little humanoids that are just there. They're these random NPCs with a little bit of backstory that you can talk to back at your home base because, oh yeah, there's a home base now too. A safe space to grow a couple extra Pikmin, purchase some items and gear, start up brand new side quests from these new characters, explore the treasure guide and the returning Piclopedia. Oh, thank God that's back. I do love the feeling of isolation the previous games had. It gave off a real Metroid vibe exploring this wild and dangerous planet all by yourself. Louis doesn't count, but interacting with the other members of your crew and seeing the base slowly expand with each new castaway found, it's really satisfying. It certainly handled the whole expanding the cast with likable characters thing a lot better than Metroid did, I can tell you that much. Listen, alright, I share the same name as the Remember Me guy from Metroid Other M. I have reason to be salty. In classic Pikmin fashion, hop into your ship, pick your level of choice, and take off. Oh. Oh, holy sh**, this game is pretty. So back when Miyamoto first revealed the game after putting me through the five stages of grief in like two minutes, the only thing that was mentioned was that the camera angle was gonna be different. Yeah, you know, I, oh man, Pikmin fans dealt with a lot that day. But yeah, sure enough, Gone is the more traditional top-down perspective in favor of a more behind the back feel, likely due to needing a control scheme where motion-based pointing was secondary rather than primary. This was my main fear going into this game, but damn it, you know, it's no surprise here, it's Nintendo, it took him forever to make the game, but it works! There is a very generous lock-on now. The cursor will lock on to important things, whether you like it or not. I thought it would be a bit much, and maybe the option to turn it off would be nice, but man, this just works too. I was always able to lock onto the thing I wanted, but if it didn't, then I can just cycle through the available choices, and that works too. Oh yeah, there's also a dog. Introducing Ochi! I will die for him. You see, unlike Pikmin 2 and 3, there's only one playable captain, so multitasking is certainly not as important as the last few games, but the inclusion of Ochi adds a shocking amount of depth to the core gameplay. He can dig, attack, and bring treasures back to the ship, just like a Pikmin. If you're separated, he does basically act like a second fully playable captain, which is cool, but you can also ride on top of him, and all of your Pikmin will latch onto dear life alongside you. You're able to charge him forward when he's next to you, but if you're on top, you can charge an enemy with all of your Pikmin and they will immediately jump on and start munching away. He can even be powered up back at the base, allowing him to carry heavier items, he can attack stronger, he can swim, he can jump? Pikmin with the jump button? Oh my god! Ochi is great. Easy contender for one of the best dogs ever made. With those slight changes in mind, once you get into the groove of things, yeah, it's, it's more Pikmin. These levels are gigantic now and bring a level of verticality never before seen in this series. The mix of the new camera angle, Ochi's jump button, and even some climbable surfaces for the first time. You can get a view of this world in a brand new way. Easily the most gorgeous and expansive locations the franchise has seen yet, and one of the best looking games Nintendo has ever done. Dude, there's a house now! Finally, what the franchise has always been missing. Couches. Ice Pikmin. Ice Pikmin! Dude, it's like if the Rock Pikmin were light blue, it's awesome. I love these new guys. They can freeze water so you can walk over it in peace, and you can also freeze enemies in place, meaning they get completely obliterated instead of just killed. <laughs> oh my god. There are also some things that hardcore fans might initially see as drawbacks. For one, you have to earn your way to the usual 100 Pikmin limit now. You start off with only 20. Well, on the surface at least, but we'll get to that. And only through finding bulbs of... Fl 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 flarlic, flarlic, can you take out 10 additional carrot guys. While on paper that does seem like a downgrade to me, this just means that the game moves at a faster pace. The earlier stages include barely any puzzles that require a massive army. It eliminates the typical early Pikmin gameplay loop of just grinding out some pellets and enemies to get to 100 as fast as humanly possible. You can still grow those Pikmin, they'll just stay in the onion, which means when you get the Flarlic, you'll have another 10 ready to go immediately. 
And on top of that, you don't even need to think about who goes in your army anymore. There's an auto button that just gives you the ideal loadout, which outside of a few select instances was exactly what I needed in that level. And hell, you can't even take out more than three Pikmin types at a single time. In total, there are eight types to choose from, with every main type returning, as well as, of course, the new ice ones. But yeah, only three can be out at once. My guess is that this is to limit any feelings of being overwhelmed with options here, because eight Pikmin types, holy cow, that's a lot. And honestly, I feel like some people forget that for the majority of Pikmin 3, you only had access to reds, yellows, and rocks. It isn't until pretty far into the game where it remembers, oh yeah, we have, uh, we have winged ones now, have fun with that. And then when you get the blues, like, the game ends. There were barely any instances of needing more than three at a single time, so I'm not just saying this to be a hardcore defender, the game never requires you to have more than three, just know that even though it sounds like a downgrade, it's fine. And besides, the gameplay loop isn't like Pikmin 3 this time around, it's more like Pikmin 2. And that's thanks to the glorious return of Caves. Oh thank god the caves are back, true happiness can finally be achieved. Is that an Emperor Bulblax coming at me at full speed? The caves in Pikmin 2 were a fairly divisive feature. Sure, they made the game a whole lot longer, but many of them had very uninteresting level designs. With most of them being randomly generated, it took Pikmin from a stressful time management strategy game to more of a dungeon crawler with some light puzzle elements. Now don't get me wrong, I did really enjoy the caves, especially the submerged castle. Have no problems and no trauma there. Even still, there was a lot of room for improvement. So fast forward and uh, yeah. This is basically why Pikmin 4 is the best one now. Actual level designs for the caves, yes! Each one not only has a unique gimmick to set it apart, but they're also all meticulously designed to be special in their own different ways. Whether it be based off of specific elements, specific enemies, specific puzzle gimmicks, maybe a special boss fight, the caves here are way more interesting than they ever were in 2. It is not even close. It's uh, sort of like when Persona went from simple grid-based dungeons in 4 to the fully-fledged worlds in 5. There you go. That comparison is sure to make someone happy. I just want to get my social rank with Brittany to an S, okay? Also, that whole auto thing from before, that also applies here. You can select your loadouts as you're entering the cave and as you exit back to the surface. So no more going to a cave and the cave was like, oops, idiot, you need all reds for this one. Go back to the ship, idiot, dummy. There's none of that. What's also cool about the caves is you're not sticking to the Pikmin limit. You may be growing your limit constantly up on the surface and it takes a while to get to 100, but underground, hey, if you find more Pikmin, they're part of your crew. Use them however you wish. It doesn't matter because remember, when you go back to the surface, you're selecting your loadout again, back to the limit. Like I said, it's a system that works. And suck it, hey Pikmin haters, you're collecting Sparklium in this one. The same collectible from that game. Must really hurt, doesn't it? And yes, this all means the return of treasures as well, with damn near anything you can think of being considered a quote unquote treasure. There is so much, there, there is so much, there is so much in this game. Because the caves are also where you find all of the castaways, and combining those with all of the stuff you can also get on the surface, there is way more stuff to collect than in all of the previous Pikmin games, Combined. It's crazy. And hell, some of those castaways are random. Kinda. It's interesting how this works out, since some of the castaways are pretty important to plot progression in order to not penalize you for enjoying the freedom of jumping around between different levels and caves as you wish, you will always get the same castaways in the same order, regardless of whatever cave you go into, which is pretty cool. Also, unlike in 2, time does still progress in the caves, just a whole lot slower, about one-sixth of the speed. It's not like it really matters, a day is not gonna end while you're in the caves, you may just come back up during the 10 second countdown. It may not seem like that big of a deal, but with time still passing and there being way more stuff to do on the surface than there ever was in Pikmin 2, there is still a bit of a fun challenge to plan out your days for peak optimization, even if there is no overarching ominous time limit. And if the lack of a stressful time limit is that big of a bother to you, then let me counteract it. The bread bugs are back, and they sing the theme of the bread bug dungeon from Pikmin 2. If you start complaining about the bread bugs, I swear to god, Aw oh, man, and the references, dude. There are references aplenty. I love these so much. The Game Boy Advance SP at the start of the game is just the tip of the iceberg, man. You can get the cartridges for Kudu Kudu Kududin, the Famicom mini cart of Shin Onigashima. Oh my god, Nintendo remembered Wave Race Blue Storm? Aw, oh, dude, and the music toys that play songs like the Lullaby from Mario 64, that's great. There's this puzzle that you slowly build up by collecting a bunch of pieces throughout the entire game, and it's the picture of the Nintendog Dachshund? That dog's really gotten around. I mean, 
mean, sure, obviously, not every treasure is some big reference, and there's no real life items like the Duracell battery in 2, which once again, they got rid of in the Switch version anyway, Still kind of upset about that, but still, it's fine. It's not like I'm getting super excited about collecting the hot dog octopus anyway. Okay, that's a lie, they're totally adorable. But really now, if you do want some of that classic stressful Pikmin gameplay, there is learning the art of Dandori. Which, by the way, turns out, totally a real Japanese word, so I'm glad to see Nintendo teaching gamers some culture. Flashback to when Miyamoto actually threw the word out during some Pikmin 3 hype. Look at that, it's like the prophecy foretold. It roughly translates to the art of time management and planning, which, yeah, that definitely defines Pikmin. But since 4 overall is a lot more chill than the previous games, Dandori takes the form of these timed challenges, where you either clear a level of all of its enemies and treasures, or in these timed battles, where you have to outperform your opponent by grabbing more items than them, with, of course, plenty of ways to screw them over with specific item attacks or even this big old bomb that will knock points away from the receiver's onion if you can bring it over to it. Unlike earlier Pikmin games, there is no traditional challenge mode that's separate from the main campaign, but this clearly is what replaces that. The same goes for the multi player. Dandori Battle is the multiplayer mode. I mean, it's no bingo battle from 3, I'll be honest, but it's still really good and plenty chaotic, which is really all I want. Except for also having a bingo board, because man, that mode is still, that is still peak right there. And having these challenge segments as part of the main story this time around is pretty genius. It adds a lot more variety and uncertainty to what a cave could contain. And you get ranked on these too, and getting a platinum is pretty damn tough in the later challenges. The computer AI for the battles actually ramps up quite significantly. It's awesome. And on top of all of that, if you want even more gameplay variety, don't worry, Pikmin 4 has got you. You can explore at night for the first time ever. That is so sick. Legends always used to tell that in the world of Pikmin, the night was terrifying and you would always see these bulb orbs and whatever enemies come out and eat up any Pikmin that you so dare leave behind. Now I get to go into that? I get to go into that dangerous pit? Oh God. So the way night expeditions work, it's essentially a mission mode. Each of the main levels has a few of them, and the goal is totally different than the core gameplay. Instead, with your time limit, you have to protect these special mounds of dirt, known as luminals, in order to receive medicine to heal the leaflings, these sort of corrupted castaways that you will find from the Dandori Caves. These segments also introduce another new Pikmin, the Glow Pikmin. Also very cute, love them. They make uh, they make spectral little noises this time around, and they're like ghosts. It's, it's really cool, I, I like them a whole lot. And these are the only ones that you can use during the night. You grow more by bringing back to the base these uh, Mario Galaxy star bits and Skyward Sword gratitude crystals. Okay, it's like, it's just a star candy that they really like in Japan, and Nintendo puts them in multiple games, and now they're in Pikmin now, so that's, that's kind of cool. They can teleport instantaneously to you, making it a lot more fun to multitask with them since you don't have to worry about rallying them back. And while they can't attack like normal, they can also group up into a giant ball and stun whoever you throw them on. These guys are awesome. That attack is very important because the enemies at night are ruthless. You know, for a few seconds everything is good, but then their eyes start to glow red with death as their only goal and they will beeline it to your luminals by any means necessary. You can set up these little ones along their way to buy yourself some time, but they're gonna take those things out too. It almost turns Pikmin into a tower defense game, which is actually a great fit for the series strategy roots. And the word roots? Yes, that is indeed a plant pun. And like I said, the glow Pikmin you can only use at night. So while you can't use all the ones that you're growing back up in the traditional gameplay style on the surface, you will gain glow seeds that you can use to summon some to replace the ones that you've lost once you're in the caves, and even transform them into normal Pikmin if you throw them into a candy bud, ultimately giving you a pretty solid reward for doing these segments outside of just simply needing to do them for some of the story. I really like these night expeditions. I guess it would be kind of cool to have a full-on level that was just at night but this is still a perfectly acceptable and really, really fun and challenging mission mode. Though, I'm pretty sure the Glow Pikmin are why we didn't get the return of the Bulbman and, like... <laughs> I'll be okay. It's not... it's not that big of a loss. I'm just really gonna miss the kids that I adopted by force because I killed their only living guardian. Dude! Okay, the amount of quality of life improvements to the typical formula here is insane. 
It took 10 years to develop Pikmin 4, and damn it, they made sure every single one of those years counted. Items like the bomb rocks and the brand new freeze rocks are no longer required to be held by a Pikmin. You now grow an inventory of them and you can pull them out whenever you want, and you, as the captain, will throw them. If an item that you want to bring back to your ship has a minimum count of Pikmin that you need to carry it back, there will be a slight pause after chucking Pikmin at it to ensure that you exclusively throw that minimum first before adding more to it if you so choose. And if there are more than the minimum carrying an item back, you can do a short whistle on it to pull back the excess, and the rest will go on about their business. If there's a chunk of items that need to be carried back to base, once all of those items are gone, the Pikmin will remain at the base instead of just chilling where the chunk was originally found. Thank you. You can also move the base around between a few different points on the surface now, which is awesome since those levels are a whole lot bigger than ever before. The Pikmin will auto-carry the items that fly out of broken gates and defeated enemies. The super spicy spray is back and it will affect every Pikmin out on the field, even if they're not directly next to you, including Ochi, he gets the effects too. If you throw Pikmin at enemies, you'll prioritize the flower ones, which are the stronger ones, but if you throw them at nectar, you'll prioritize the leaves, the weaker ones, which is fantastic. Flower pellets will only show the colors of whichever Pikmin Pikmin you have out at that time. Every single Pikmin, even the ones outside of your immediate group, will follow you to the next floor of a cave. Thank God. In general, the Pikmin are way smarter than ever when it comes to following paths. They finally managed to share more than one brain cell this time and they don't get stuck on walls and bridges and ramps. Oh my God, that's amazing. They're finally not idiots. Inactive Pikmin that are just standing there can be made active by just walking next to them instead of needing to whistle them or touch them skin to skin. There's a brand new rewind ability that can be used for as little as a minute back rather than needing to reset an entire day, which is great for newcomers who don't want to replay a large portion of gameplay due to a stupid decision that causes a bunch of Pikmin to die all out of nowhere. But if you want to stomach all those deaths because you're a maniac, you can easily just not use it if you want that challenge. God, and the Pikmin will sing music from their previous games if you just walk around with them. Ah! It's so cute! Wow, this game took 10 years to develop? No way. Dude, like I went back to Pikmin 3 Deluxe right after beating Pikmin 4 and wow, they are they are so much dumber in 3. It's it's crazy. Whew, okay. Let's take a step back, not to be a bigger fanboy than I'm already being, but let's be real, there are a couple of downsides. For one, enemies no longer respawn on the surface, only underground. Doesn't matter how many days pass after you kill them, they're gonna stay dead. Sure, you can still grind a couple of pellets every single day at your base, but still, an odd choice for those who like to grind out Pikmin a bunch when you have some free time. Although a new addition, every single Pikmin has its own onion now that you can find, which is kinda cool. Next up, while the game does look incredibly gorgeous, I will be real, it is kind of a shame that it doesn't randomly rain like it did in Pikmin 3. Clearly, not a big deal, but it was really cool when it happened back there because like, the weather was different, the mood was different, the music was slightly different. It was nice, it was a nice bit of atmosphere, and it would have been nice here too. There's no photo mode like 3 had either. Like listen, this game is great and all, but clearly we're missing out on the vibes here. Oh man, the tutorial. Yeah, the tutorial is very, very long, there's a, there's a lot of text, and like, man, if you're reading all of that text, it takes almost an hour before they finally let the shackles off, and even then, text boxes still pop up from time to time after that. It's... It's a, it's, a, it's a lot. Thankfully, a majority of it can be skipped, so on multiple playthroughs, you don't have to worry about it, but it's certainly alarming if this is your very first Pikmin game. There is a lot of text. And then, if you're a bit of a Pikmin vet like I am, you may also think the game is a bit too easy. A good majority of the time with these enemies, if you just charge them with Ochi, and you have a bunch of Ice Pikmin with you, they will freeze the enemy, and then you have a couple extras to attack it, and before you know it, that enemy is frozen and dead in no time. This makes enemies and bosses not feel anywhere near as threatening as they used to. Considering this game is clearly very similar to Pikmin 2, which had that spray that would turn enemies into rocks, it's not too different than that, but still, it's pretty easy. You could just not use these things, but come on, be real. There's also a bit of a lack of variety in terms of the bosses, like a lot of them just boil down to it's a normal enemy, but bigger. You still never know what you're gonna get when you jump into a cave for the first time, but overall, it's definitely lacking a bit in terms of having these really big boys that have you go, Oh god, I'm screwed. Now granted, considering we are using Pikmin 2 as a base, you gotta remember, that game had a lot of bullshit, and I do not think that is what we should go back to. Some of the late game challenges definitely require some extra thought power, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the lack of a super spicy difficulty mode like 3 Deluxe introduced, maybe having a smaller Pikmin limit and a less powerful Ochi charge so you can't just cheese enemies all the time, would have been a nice reward for beating the game the first time. It also doesn't help that some of the Pikmin kind of feel underutilized too. Getting a whole 8 Pikmin to work with in your stable, I guess it was inevitable, and while they're not totally useful, Useless, it definitely feels like the wind Pikmin could have had some more use rather than feeling like, oh, they're just a means to carry treasures in a different way. 
That's, that's kind of what they boil down to for most of the game. Also, the music is kind of mid, and that's upsetting. Like, it's very atmospheric and clearly fitting, but we're missing a lot of the memorable melodies like those found in the previous games. 1, 2, and 3 also had a lot of atmospheric music, but there were some catchy melodies to support those. And here in 4? I mean, the title screen is sick, but I cannot for the life of me remember the tunes for any of the levels. And that's a shame. There's no amiibo support, which is just upsetting because the franchise has the best amiibo under its belt. There are no achievements like there were in 3 Deluxe, which I thought were a great addition. I mean, why not? They were there before. You, you made that a special thing that wasn't in 3, but was in 3 Deluxe, but not here. Okay. Now obviously, I'm not going to claim that any of this really hampers the overall game experience because it's still a fantastic game from start to finish, but these are some things that I hope a patch could fix in the future. Oh yeah, there's also co-op in this game, but... No, no it's not. Like the achievements, they made sure to add full co-op to Pikmin 3 Deluxe. And here, it's just like the Mario Galaxy co-star mode. No thanks. Hopefully this can be addressed too. Fingers crossed. Ah man, who cares, this is still one of the best games Nintendo's ever made. But now, I think enough time has passed. It's time for the spoiler section. Which, real quick, uh, can I just say how crazy it is that there is a spoiler section for a Pikmin game anyway? Like in the previous titles, the, the spoilers really boil down to what the ending looked like, and Louis a piece of sh We got a lot left to talk about, so let's get to it. Louis is a piece of sh Wow, you finally saved Captain Olimar, and then you let the credits roll, only to be met with a Louis jump scare. God damn it. So yes, just like in Pikmin 2, where you fixed your company's debt and then you had to go back for Louie, here you save Olimar and then you have to go back for Ochi. You gotta fix him up and get that leaf on his tail completely eliminated so he can come back home with the rescue corps. And, and Louie just happens to be there too. When you're done with the credits and you continue on with the game, you get two more full levels to explore, with a few caves in each, as well as some Dandori segments where... Uh... I guess Louie is completely cracked out at this stuff? Whenever you fight Leafling Olimar in the campaign, he's like, Oh man, I don't know if you could possibly beat me. Wink emoji. While Louie is just here wrecking my life. Oh my god. Uh, good, good, good for him? I guess? I, I didn't know he was good at this stuff. Outside of the main campaign, freeing Olimar also unlocks his shipwreck tail, which is... Basically just Pikmin 1 again, but with the Pikmin 4 skin? Like, it's not like the Olimar missions in 3 Deluxe that just feel like, Hey, uh, this time you play as Olimar. No. The shipwreck tale really makes things feel different. You got 30 ship parts that you need to collect. You only have red, blue, and yellow Pikmin at your disposal. There's no dog for a while until you find Moss partway through. And you have not a 30, but a 15 day limit. So the pressure is on at all times. The levels may be the same, but the enemies? They're different. This is incredible. Perhaps this story is what does add a lot more fuel to the idea of this retconning the events of the actual first game, but again, I don't care. This mode is awesome. These sorts of limitations are something I think a theoretical hard mode for the main campaign so interesting. Because I did the shipwreck tale, and I just wanted more of that. Plus, one of the bosses is the Emperor Bulblax, and you get the piggy bank out of him, which is amazing. And the ending of it is basically the same as the first game too. Oh, it's so, oh, it's so, so good. The music is also better for these stages too. A lot of the songs sound like these remixes and combinations of songs from 1 and 2, which is incredibly fitting and really adds to this mode's different vibe. Also, by the way, kind of off topic, but uh, bro, they brought the Smoky Prog back? God. God! And then after that, once you finish the shipwreck tale, then you unlock the Trial of the Sage Leaf, a series of 10 incredibly challenging Dandori levels. And throughout them, you get rewarded with a white and a purple onion, the first time those two Pikmin types have ever had them, meaning you can grind those types up on the surface for the first time. That's so cool. Really fun and expansive extra levels, one of which includes a beady long legs jump scare. Oh god, they include these greatly challenging caves, you have Olimar's shipwreck tale, the trial of the sage leaf. Obviously the game isn't done when the first set of credits roll, so whether you call this the post game or the end game, it doesn't matter. This all rounds out Pikmin 4 to be one of the most content dense games Nintendo has ever produced. That's sure, DLC would be great to get even more to do, but at its base price, it is hard to do better than this. It took me 35 hours to beat this game. Oh my god, that's so much and I want to do it all over again. <sighs> all right, let's talk about the cavern for a king. This is the final dungeon, which of course is an insane gauntlet and it's pretty challenging. And at the end, hey, look at that. You find Louie, who had kicked Moss to the curb because of course he did, he's a jerk. And he also somehow tamed the 
this f***ing thing? Man, the ancient sire hound. This is such a good final fight. I love that this dog theme is carried out throughout so many elements of the game. Hey, that main ship that you're bringing all the treasure back to? That's the SS Beagle. It makes sense now why that puzzle that you're collecting is the Nintendog. Your captain, her name is Shepard. Of course, there's Ochi and Moss. They're definitely dog coded. So yeah, to end off with this incredibly huge furball in the longest and most complex fight in the series, ah, uh, it's the perfect finale for this adventure. Once all of this is said and done, Louis is taken back by force. He should never be allowed outside again. The Sire Hound goes about its business. Ochi is fixed up, able to return with the crew, and Moss sort of becomes the new leader of the Pikmin, which is a pretty cool character arc for a dog thing. You know, they are dog coded, but I don't really know what these things are. Eh, at least they're pretty cute. And then some extra little bonus once you're done with that, you get some side quests from Louis, where you gather a bunch of enemies in the caves because he wants to make a soup or something? I don't know, man. Louis, Louis sucks. I'm so happy the Piclopedia is back, man, because Louis's entries for everything are just the most unhinged things. You go to the Glow Pikmin and he's like, doesn't smell alive. <laughs> God. God, I hate Louis so much. And strangely enough, finishing this Louis quest unlocks the ability for you to carry back stuff to the base yourself, like with your own bare hands. This isn't really helpful at this point of the game, which I guess is a fitting reward coming from Louie. Thanks, you son of a- But yeah, that's... That's Pikmin 4. Easily one of the best games Nintendo's ever made. You know, no big deal, I guess. Call it a bias, call it me being a Nintendo fanboy, call it whatever you want. Pikmin is one of the best franchises this company has ever developed. The four mainline games are all incredible for their own reasons. You can make an argument as to why each and every one of them is the best one, and you would all be correct. Having them all on Switch as well is amazing for accessibility, because I know there are plenty of people who are playing Pikmin 1 and 2 for the first time, and experiencing that nah, these games aren't cozy. They're actually incredibly difficult, and they hate you. They just hate you and want you to die. And I don't care, man, I'm still a fan of Hey Pikmin. That game's cute. We got those short movies, there are more people exposed to Pikmin than ever. There's a ton of new merchandise available, which is awesome, because they're all great. Look at this Ice Pikmin ice tray. It's, it's amazing. It's all just so, so good, man. It took a long time to get here, like a long time, but damn it, Pikmin 4 delivered in not only every possible way, but better. And I could not be happier. And with that, I'll end it off with one final question to ponder over. When's Pikmin 5? I'm tired of waiting.